first, I want to introduce myself and discuss briefly what, what qualifies me to talk about this topic. Um, and then we'll go right into neck pain, exactly what it is, and also why someone would have neck pain. Because pretty much, you know, everyone will have neck pain some point in their lives. Uh, and also, I'll discuss about some of the treatment options that are available. And then after that, I'll take any uh, questions you may have. Uh, by the way, in the background is uh, the National Monument, currently undergoing renovation. Uh, that's where I spend most of my life, Washington, D.C. Uh, I love it out here, but I also miss uh, D.C. Uh, from time to time. Um, so <clears throat> in terms of uh, education, uh, I went to Swarthmore College. Uh, some of you may know, but it's a small liberal arts college out in East Coast, uh, Pennsylvania. It's about 300 students per class. And I initially um, wanted to become an artist. And so I majored in studio art. That's where I developed uh, my passion for working with my hands, creating interesting things uh, that will help uh, people you know, have interesting experience. Um, and, and then I eventually fell in love with biology. And then I combined those two things um, and, uh, and, and, you know, decide to go into medicine. I guess my impetus for going into medicine was that while I was um, studying art, I had an opportunity to go volunteer at a local hospital. And I really love spending time with people and listening to their stories uh, and then really trying to figure out um, using knowledge of science, uh, technology, and, and medicine to, you know, help them go through some of the toughest times in their life. So I thought that was super rewarding. So medicine allowed me the opportunity to combine both my passions. And so I was lucky enough to uh, move on and um, attend Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons. I didn't know at the time, but uh, Columbia has a premier program in everything and anything, neurology and neuroscience. Also they have a phenomenal neurosurgery program. And so, um, I wasn't intending to, but um, I got to meet some wonderful mentors and, and friends um, who guided me through my medical uh, career planning. And I somehow ended up um, go, uh, go undergoing a neurosurgery training program. Uh, and that's where I decided um, in neurosurgery is uh, the, the field that I want to dedicate the rest of my life to. It's the only part of the human body where if you look at the hardware, it's really difficult to figure out exactly how it works. If you look at a heart, if you look at a joint, um, mechanically it's pretty simple and one can readily understand why it's shaped that way and you know, how it works. Um, but you know, brain and spine is not like that at all. And so I found that to be really exciting and challenging at the same time. So um, you know, I made the decision. I'm, I'm, I'm very happy with the fact that I made the decision. Um, so I got a lot of help um, during throughout medical school, and my mentors really pushed me to try out for Johns Hopkins, which at the time was number one neurosurgery program in the country, one of the top in the world. And I was very fortunate enough to be able to give it an opportunity to train at Johns Hopkins. So this is where I completed all of my advanced neurosurgical training, all the way from internship to uh, the two fellowships. This is, this is a humongous hospital system with uh, more than 1,500 beds uh, scattered throughout Northern Virginia, Washington, D.C., Baltimore, and actually uh, abroad. And so I was able to um, see people with all kinds of challenging neurosurgical problems uh, that one may, you know, a neurosurgeon may rarely see, but all came to Hopkins. So I was able to get phenomenal training. And, and I owe all my... Um, all my training and all my skills to my time spent at Johns Hopkins and, and my mentors there. Uh, I really fell in love with um, spine, uh, particularly because a very complex organ um, and, and, and you know, almost everybody has spine issues uh, at some point in their life. So I thought that if I knew spine and I knew how to help people with spine problems, then I could help a lot of people. Uh, one thing that was phenomenal, really, really good at Johns Hopkins was that it was um, a place where you could get cutting edge training. So I was able to uh, get really fast level with robotic neurosurgery, which is a really uh, burgeoning field. 
Um, and, and we actually at Providence, we just acquired a robotic system. So we're, we're going to start offering robotic surgery to people uh, who, who need it. But also I was able to uh, become really proficient in minimally invasive spine. Nobody wants a big operation. So nobody wants surgery to begin with. And then of uh, those who, who um, unfortunately need surgery, nobody wants a big, massive surgery. And so, you know, we were really, um, I was very fortunate to be working with a, a program that was really forward thinking at, at, the, uh, at the cutting edge of the field. And then uh, towards the end of my time at Hopkins, I really became fascinated with functional and pain neurosurgery. So what is that? Um, so it's, it's a really a niche within neurosurgery. And uh, I spent a whole year trying to understand how our nervous system is put together. People tend to focus on spine and brain nerves, hand, foot. And um, there's a good reason for that because all these organs are complex, takes a lifetime of learning and training to master a specific body part. But functional neurosurgery is looking at a global, sort of uh, taking a global look at how our nervous system is put together and using truly advanced technology such as electricity, neuromodulation, ultrasound, uh, all these different, uh, even in optical energy, to stimulate the nervous system to recover uh, and then bring function back. Historically, neurosurgeons were very good at taking things out of human body, such as tumors or, uh, or, or fixed spinal fractures. Um, and we, you know, we, we've been very good at that, but we really haven't been good at giving function back to injured nervous system. And this is a, you know, a, a truly novel field within neurosurgery. And I was very lucky to be part of that uh, fellowship. Uh, one thing that, um, I mean, I can't believe I did this looking back, and, but in the middle of residency, I realized that I have a dream that just kind of never died since I was a kid, which was to serve um, in the military. And there's a lot of reasons for that, but basically I learned that when I turned 32 in the middle of residency, that was gonna be my last chance to join the military. So I actually, Took a, took a knee during residency as a neurosurgery resident, and then went into um, army as active duty, served as a, actually as a grunt infantry, eventually somehow made it to special operations and served as a Green Beret combat medic. And I love my military community. I love the service mindset. I love everybody who's part of it. And uh, I'm currently involved with NATO, Department of Defense, as well as many different components of the, of the uh, Department of Defense and I'm contributing um, through various um, venues um, using my medical knowledge, which is a true, a true honor. Another thing uh, that uh, I'm really um, lucky to be doing is that while I was at Johns Hopkins, I had an opportunity to take a position with the FDA. And uh, now it's my third year with the agency and I am the neurosurgeon for the FDA. I look at every single neurosurgical devices that come through the FDA. Um, and I review the, the clinical trial results. I look at the application for new devices. Uh, and and really, it's a really rewarding work because I, I'm, a, I'm helping a, a regulatory team uh, really protect uh, our you know, people's uh, well-being. Um, we're, we're basically given a task to um, keep the companies honest um, and make sure they run the highest quality trial um, and bring evidence before us so that we can determine, you know, which technologies within the world of neurosurgery should be expedited to, um, to go into use so that people can benefit from it while keeping everyone safe. And so uh, that, that is a really phenomenal experience. And one benefit um, is that because I get to see every single neurosurgical device and the data behind them, I can figure out which one's actually good and effective and safe and then incorporate that knowledge into my neurosurgical practice day to day. So I hope that my, the people that I can take care of, um, you know, can benefit from my experience. So basically, what is my mission statement as a neurosurgeon who is part of this community? Uh, it's pretty simple. Uh, it's to really make a, you know, individualized decision uh, for, for, for the person who comes to see me. I understand that everyone's spine is different. Everyone's um, values different, everyone's goals are different. So, um, you know, a, a sort of cookie cutter approach to everyone's 
problem, even though it may be affecting the same level of spine, is really, I think, a suboptimal approach. And so I really try to listen to the person who comes see me and then tailor a, a custom plan uh, that fits that, uh, that, that person's goals uh, and lifestyle. And another thing about neurosurgical conditions um, is that uh, once it happens, unfortunately, it's a lifelong thing. It's like diabetes, heart problems. Once you have spine problems and, and neck pain, almost always um, it can come and go, but it's a lifelong issue. And there's a lot of things that a person needs to do consistently throughout life in order to stay out of trouble. And so I really believe that once I connect with somebody, it's a lifelong commitment and that uh, you know, I do my very best to maintain their lifelong relationship. It's a team approach. Um, I'm just one person. I'm just a simple neurosurgeon. Um, and and uh, you know, all the problems that we deal with are very, very complex and challenging. Uh, sometimes there's no right answer. And I lean on uh, my other colleagues, such as you know, neurologists, um, uh, primary care physician, chiropractors, um, even acupuncturists, physical therapists, masseuse. I rely on all these people to you know, provide the best care that one can get. Uh, uh, you know, it, whatever the problem may be. Uh, and then the last thing that I touch upon this is, you know, um, there's a lot of noise out there, a lot of distraction, a lot of um, uh, fake news, as they call it, right, um, uh, regarding neurosurgery, medicine. And so my goal is to kind of cut through the, the BS out there and then really deliver um, the highest quality evidence-based information to you so that you can benefit from that. So uh, without further ado, let's get into the, the, the topic uh, of today's talk, the our conversation uh, is neck pain. So the, the, this is the outline. So we're going to talk about what is neck pain? Why do we have it? What are the uh, treatment options available to a person with neck pain? And then I'm going to just briefly touch upon what a surgery involves um, and what goes through a surgeon's mind as he or she is assessing uh, someone with a, with a chronic neck pain. So I'll start with a very um, simple question. What exactly is a neck? And everyone has an idea what a neck is, but you'll be surprised. Um, everyone's definition of neck is a little different. My definition is that neck is part of a long chain of bones called the spine, and neck just happens to be the top seven bones. Um, and I don't know if you can see my cursor, but this is, this is a first cervical vertebra. It looks like a ring. And then there's a number two. Um, it has a little peg. It allows you all the rotation. The, 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 you know, it basically gives you the no motion. Um, and then there's a number three, four, five, six, and seven bones um, that make up your neck. But that's just from a, you know, uh, from a more like an anatomical, very boring definition. But if you actually look at what really neck is, it's actually um, a part of a huge complex system called, again, the spine. And neck is sort of arbitrarily defined as the first seven bones. Um, but you know, it's really influenced by what else is happening at your hip, at your knee, and your ankle, um, in your um, other parts of spine. And neck is uh, always responding to things that are happening elsewhere in the body. And so it's really, uh, a neck is really uh, a part of a, a, a system. Um, and so I really want you to um, think sort of bigger picture, you know, when you think about neck pain. So just because you have pain in the neck doesn't always mean, actually, in fact, most of the time, neck pain is not coming from, not, not coming from the neck because there's a problem with the neck. A lot of the times it's the neck pain is there because there's an issue with the hip or the lower spine. And the neck is just responding to the, the things that are happening below. And the way kind of it works, and as you can see in this diagram that I included, um, if the rest of the spine is straight, the neck will naturally position to be straight. And that's where the neck pain is minimal because uh, this is what uh, we is defined as, you know, biomechanically perfect. You know, everything from head down to the knee are aligned. 
But let's say that you have a knee injury or ankle injury, or you have a painful foot, and now you're not able to stand up straight. Uh, then what happens is uh, that will actually impact how your hip is positioned um, above your head. And then as a hip starts rotating and you start standing kind of awkwardly, that will actually directly impact how your lower spine is positioned. And then your neck will immediately automatically compensate uh, how it's uh, sitting inside your body. And then this can lead to sort of a suboptimal abnormal biomechanics. And that's where a lot of the pain issues can arise. So the, the reason why I bring this up is when someone has neck pain, I ask a lot of questions uh, that may not really be related to the neck. And a lot of people say, well, why are you asking about my head? Why are you asking you know, whether my thigh muscles tight or whether I recently hurt my neck or whether I'm wearing an insole in my feet for my foot injury? Well, that's because usually the neck pain is coming from um, elsewhere. So just remember, neck is usually a bystander um, to what's the other problems are going on in the rest of the skeletal system. Uh, but there are other some obvious reasons um, that causes uh, the, the neck to hurt. And so the number one uh, reason why we have neck pain is because the neck is made the way it is. And what I mean by that is neck is designed to be mobile. The neck is designed to help you look around the world. Um, and we're constantly moving our neck to engage the world and live our life. And the price we pay for this amazing ability to look around is that we have, we sustain significant amount of wear and tear at every level, the seven bones that I showed you, um, they constantly wear down. One, so every time we wake up in the morning, uh, that's a little more wear and tear at each level of the spine. And for the seven bones, they're not all worn down at the same rate. Everyone has their own favorite level. And that all, it, it's really difficult to predict which level one likes to use, but there's always one or two levels that, you, that one wears out faster than the others. And again, why? Because you like moving those levels. And so the price we pay again for the amazing mobility that we have in our neck is a wear and tear, and that's normal. And unfortunately, there is really nothing we can do to stop or reverse the wear and tear. So the whole game that we have to play, the whole thing we have to keep in our mind is what are we going to do to slow down the wear and tear so that you can limit the amount of pain you have uh, or decrease the amount of pain you have and then prevent it from flaring up. That is the main goal. And there's a lot of things in modern life that actually makes uh, this really challenging. So if you look at this diagram that I included, and we see this all the time, especially millennials, and also I do this too. But if you look around, everyone's doing this. If you look at the right side, everyone's got their cell phone, everyone's flexing their neck. And the point I want to make here is if you look, if you sit, stand state, um, straight up, excuse me, and this is zero degrees, I told you this is a biomechanically perfect posture when you're looking at the horizon and not looking at the cell phone, there's about 10 to 12 pounds of weight uh, at each level of those little spines uh, in the neck. And that is uh, normal and ideal. And that's what the neck is built for. But if you start flexing at the neck and start looking down and you stay in this position for a long time because you're you're knitting, you're working on your laptop, or you're looking at your phone, look at the amount of pressure you're actually exerting on each level, 60 pounds. That's a huge difference. And that will rapidly accelerate the wear and tear in your spine. And that's what gets people into trouble. Um, and there's, of course, uh, you know, uh, things that are not normal, diseases. You know, that can definitely cause neck pain, such as uh, rheumatoid arthritis, osteoporosis or cancer of the neck, you know, can all cause neck pain and these are abnormal things. And uh, usually the red flags are, you know, if you have unintended weight loss and uh, pain in the neck that is so severe that you can't move your neck for weeks on end. Um, or if you have neck pain and you got weakness or pain in your arms and hands. Now, those are things uh, that are very worrisome and warrant an investigation. But almost, almost always, the neck pain 
is due to, again, some kind of biomechanical issue, such as tight hip, some uh, uh, walking you know, difficulties, some balance issues that translate to the neck, which overworks the neck um, and then causes fatigue in the muscles. That's usually almost always the case. And almost always without any kind of like procedure or surgery, it gets better unless there's disease. Now, um, as I told you, everyone defines neck differently. And so I see all these variations when someone comes in and says, I have neck pain. You will say, I have neck pain. Well, where is it? And then they'll point, for instance, on you know, this figure on the right, the shoulder. And some people say, well, you know, I have neck pain and it's in the back of the head. I say neck, some people say I have neck pain, it's in the shoulder blade. And some people say I have neck pain, it's actually in the head. Uh, the interesting thing is though, all these areas can be involved when you actually have neck pain. Why? Because as I told you, neck is not an isolated structure. It's made up of seven bones, but it's connected to muscles, ligaments, tendons. It's connected to the rest of the spine. It's always responding to things. It's always interacting with other structures. So when you have a neck problem, a purely a neck problem, your pain can actually be elsewhere and not in the neck. So also one should be aware of that. So the neck is made up of many, many structures. And there's obviously the bone, the seven bones. And the seven bones have to kind of you know, join together. So that's where the joint comes into play. And then interweaving through the muscle are these soft, very delicate structures, which are the nerves. And then wrapping the whole thing and acting as a scaffold are the muscles. So really my job is to figure out when you come in and say, you know, I got neck pain, I have to kind of figure out, is it the muscle? Is it the bone? Is it the nerve? Is it actually not the neck? Is it somewhere else? Or is it something, is there somewhere else a problem? And then also neck is involved. So those are some of the things that go through my mind, you know, when I, you know, um, listen to your story. Now, um, this is a very important uh, slide. And so, this is uh, the story that happens to all of us. I told you, everyone goes through a wear and tear through our life. It's a price we pay uh, for the amazing mobility we have of our neck. No one is immune from this. Even Olympians have really bad looking neck. And so starting the age of 20 to 30, everyone starts having what an MRI or CT report call multi-level degenerative disease. It's actually not a disease. It's a wear and tear. And what happens, the first thing that happens is, and you, if you look at this figure in the center, there's a healthy disc. This is what we're born with. And around age 20, 30, the healthy disc starts losing water. This is actually supposed to be a very, you know, plump jelly-like structure encased in a hard shell. And it acts as a major shock absorber, so absorber in our spine. And unfortunately, um, as we use them a lot, they lose water. And no one really knows why, but they lose water content. And then the content turns from jelly into a little chalky material. And then also it loses volume. And this is a reason why we get shorter as we age, because we, there's about 30 to 35 discs in our body, and each one loses water. That's about an inch or inch and a half as you add them up. And also this is the same reason why you're, we're all a little taller in the morning because when we lie down, you know, our spine will kind of pull apart. It will suck a little bit of water back into each disc. And then when you stand up, you're a little taller. But as you walk around, we, we start, you know, uh, putting more pressure on the disc and they lose this water again. But over time, it will lose all ability to expand again. And then it turns into, it, it goes from here to this in the center. Well, now there is no more shock absorption. That everything in the inside is gone. We use them all up, uh, but there's no warranty, so we can't replace it. Um, and then, you know, there is uh, a, this hard shell, which is literally like an empty tire, you know? And, and what happens is because there's no support from the disc, the spine now is literally wobbly. I mean, these are not big motions, but these are micro motions and the body feels it. It's, it's just like driving a car with flat tire. All that you know, unsteadiness and wobbly motion, 
the spine's experiencing all the time. Well, spine hates that. When it hates that, it starts actually growing bone on the edges. Um, why? Because it, it actually tries to form a bone bridge across this you know, disc that's not functioning anymore. And then it actually tries to fuse. So if you think about it, you hear about fusion surgeries a lot. And yes, you know, it's kind of overdone. You know, there's a lot of bad reputation surrounding it. But actually, in reality, the very thing that our body tries to do when it breaks down so badly that there's instability, then it actually tries to fuse. But it's actually that process that gets people into trouble. There's a lot of people who will have fused necks. They never had surgery, but their body just fused it. And they don't have any pain. They don't have any issues. And they kind of completed that process without getting into trouble. But for some people, because of the way they're made, as a bone is trying to grow over the disc and trying to fuse with the next one, it actually starts growing bone towards a nerve. And of, and of course, this empty shell of a disc, you know, pooches out 360 degrees, and then it digs into the nerve as well. I mean, it's almost like a sick joke that we're made this way. Like, you know, the, high, the most mobile part of the spine, you know, is where the nerve goes through. And then, of course, where the disc sticks into is where the nerve is. The most sensitive part of the nerve is right here. And then as the bone starts growing over, it actually sometimes will grow into the nerve. That's what causes nerve pain, shooting sensation, you know, into your arms and hands. It can also cause a lot of neck pain. So a lot of the neck pain actually is coming from this normal degeneration. Now let's talk about what, what you know, why then that translates to sore neck. Now, this is where, um, <clears throat> this is a very important slide because once the spine degenerates and the discs are not doing its job and it's trying to grow bone to basically fuse itself, it is a very, very slow process. It takes about 20 or 30 years. Um, and so in the meantime, this very structure that keeps the spine together, mobile, do all the work and keep it from falling apart and being constantly unstable are your muscles. The muscle is an incredibly important scaffold to your entire neck. Um, but if you, uh, but it, the, the, the thing is though, uh, we use these muscles a lot, but we don't really work them out. We don't really try to get them strong. And so, as we age and our spine continues to go through the wear and tear process, we're not taking care of our muscles in the back, which is the main muscle that keeps our neck pulled so that we can look uh, and you know we can look up. If these muscles start getting weak, then your head will start falling forward because there's no support from the disc. And so you're working these muscles all day and then they get really tired. And when you turn your neck side to side, sometimes you're twisted and then your spine actually becomes unstable and then makes a sudden jerk, the muscles will get, get very surprised and then we'll go into spasm. And then that can you know, sometimes cause a severe neck pain and flare up, which can last two to three weeks. And so again, a lot of the neck pain is coming from, you know, usually issues somewhere else in the body, such as hip, um, knee, ankle, feet, translating, up to um, uh, pressure up to the neck. And also um, it can come from the, uh, the wear and tear uh, because this is slow progressive wear and tear uh, that happens at the neck. All right, so that is sort of the story behind, um, you know, why all of us have neck pain um, and, you know, the, the, the basically the mechanism behind, you know, the pain generation. And so then what do we do about it? Well, as I told you, the main goal that we should all have is to take care of our spine. We only have one spine. We can't take parts in and out, you know, like a car. Uh, and so once we're born with our spine, that's all we got until, until our, you know, the end of our lives. And the more we use them, the faster you wear them out, the faster earlier you're gonna get into trouble. The better you take care of it, it's kind of like taking care of your teeth to have a good dentition. We brush teeth every day. But if you don't take care of your spine every day, then there's, you know, of course, going to be consequences uh, that, you know, we have to pay, uh, that we have to face um, as spine continues to degenerate.
But there are treatment options to get you through the tough times. And it largely divides into three categories. There's non-surgical. Um, and this is the main bread and butter uh, category. Uh, and this is what gets almost everybody um, uh, you know, to, to a better spot. But in few patients, they might need a procedure done, such as an injection um, uh, of a steroid or numbing medication into different parts of the spine um, to get, get you through the, um, the pain episode. And then there's surgery, and this is really for a few people. You know, when there's significant mechanical problem to the spine, really causing significant severe pain, and there is no way to manage the pain, and there's a danger to the nerve of the spinal cord, then surgery is usually the way to do it. But again, this is really um, for, for, for few people. So non-surgical options is a huge, huge basket of category of treatment options, but it starts with lifestyle modification. I told you a lot of us, you know, like to look down. It's actually easy, um, you know, and, and if, for some people because they have weak muscles in the back of the neck. And so it's easy for them to kind of put their head down, their neck down. Um, but that's actually very bad for the spine. As I told you, you increase your pressure on each spinal level by more than fivefold, and that will accelerate your wear and tear, the degeneration process. So by always keeping your head up as much as you can, looking into the horizon, bringing your cell phone up to your eye or bring your computer up to your eye, bring your magazine up to your eye, you know, that is what slows down the degeneration process. Sleeping is also very important. So how you sleep can really help your spine recover and then uh, prevent it from uh, going into another pain episode. So um, I'm, I'm more than happy to share with you sleeping tips. If you email me, I'll share contact uh, with you at the end. Uh, but I have some sleeping tips uh, for people with neck pain. You know, how you support your neck when you go to bed has a huge impact on your quality of life and how you manage your neck pain. There's also medications such as um, steroid, uh, Tylenol, ibuprofen, gabapentin. There's many, many medications. Um, but one thing that um, really works well in general is a combination of Tylenol and ibuprofen. Some people like to go back and forth throughout the day at Tylenol, ibuprofen, Tylenol, ibuprofen, because those two do medications kind of are synergistic, but they work through different mechanisms of pain. And so people like um, that trying that. If you need something more such as opioid medication, now we're getting into the realm where you might need to seek um, further help because those are not those are not the medications you want to stay on long term, and we have to find um, a better long term solution. Such as frequent massages. There's nothing wrong with that. I told you, as our neck degenerates, our muscles are working harder and harder, ever more than ever before, and so you want to treat your muscles well. And so one way to do that is massage, and it releases uh, tension. Um, it can release the trigger points. It can relax the muscles and helps it recover so that you can work the muscles again the next day when you wake up. Acupuncture kind of works the same way. It really it, uh, allows, to, uh, allows the muscles to relax, release electrodes. Um, there's a lot of science being generated be, you know, for acupuncture. If it helps you, you should try it. There's no reason to not try it. Exercise and stretching is the mainstay though. So lifestyle modification, obviously it slows down the wear and tear. Medication, massage, acupuncture is really treating the symptoms. But exercise and stretching is a mainstay to really slow down the wear and tear process. Why? Because as we get older, our front muscles get really tight. We like to kind of like ball up. We kind of like to stay close to the ground. And our neck muscles, our strap muscles, our chest muscles, our thigh muscles kind of, like, kind of contract. Even if, you know, we don't even notice it, but we're kind of hunched over a lot of times and those muscles get really tight and limits the range of motion. So you need to stretch those muscles out. And then once they're loose, you got to strengthen the back muscles called a posterior chain. The muscles that go all the way from the back of your head, all the way down to your buttocks. You want to put more, more strength into the muscles so that you're, you're basically pulled back. It's kind of like a, 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 a puppet you know, that is getting, uh, you know, stood up, you know, you're pulling the strings back and the, and the part, 
the puppet basically stands up, the posterior chain muscles kind of work the same way, it kind of brings you back and then keeps your spine in uh, decent alignment. And only that can only be done with a combination of stretching the front and exercising the back and building those mus muscles. And that's really hard to do, especially if you don't exercise a lot or if you have a lot of pain. So you use a combination of treating the pain so you can actually undergo exercise or physical therapy to start getting stronger. And that's the mainstay treatment for neck pain. And that needs to be done throughout your entire life because I told you, spine's always you know, wearing down. And so you want to constantly take care of your neck, just like we take care of our teeth. It's no different. And then the last thing is some people really like traction. Why does traction help? As I told you, as, we, as our spine degenerates, the discs collapse. And then, and then really the, the, distance, the distance between one spine to the next becomes very short. And then when that happens, uh, as, I, as I showed you before, the nerves in between get pinched. And so the distance between this spine and this spine get, uh, gets smaller because the disc is coming down. What happens is it puts a lot of pressure on the nerve because things are collapsing around it. And also, um, I didn't talk about it, but there are these two little joints in the back of the spine that also acts as little joints. Uh, but you know th those joints uh, are under a lot of uh, pressure and they also collapse as well because these two spine levels are coming down closer to each other. So traction will literally kind of pull the spine apart and then suck a little bit of water back into that disc and then allows the spine to stay tall temporarily. But again, with gravity and with, with usage of the spine, you, your spine is going to collapse again because there's, again, no, no disc there. And so all this so attraction is more of a temporary therapeutic solution. But again, the mainstay is stretching and exercise. So um, this is you know, a, a slide about sleeping. Sleeping, how you sleep is very important. So if you look at the figure on the left, um, a lot of people have different, you know, posture preferences. It doesn't really matter. The, the worst posture you can have is sleeping on your belly. But as long as you're sleeping on a side or your back, you're good. You're protecting your spine. You're treating your spine well. And then when you're sleeping on the side, you definitely want to have at least two pillows, not too firm, not too hard. The key is keeping your spine in a neutral, neutral position. Um, and then head over your shoulder, shoulders over your hip. And you want to have a pillow, you know, that will support your neck so that it's not kinking. If you look at the figure to the right, too high, it curves the neck. Too low, it bends the neck. You need to have just the right size, a medium firmness. Um, and that should keep your spine in alignment. But that is not enough. If you're sleeping on a side, I actually recommend you need at least two more pillows, one between your knees. Why? It prevents your hip from rotating. I told you, spine is a one connected system. If your hip rotates, shoulder rotates, and your neck's going to be twisted, and that's going to cause a lot of pain. So you want to have at least one more pillow here. I recommend another pillow under your arm to prevent your shoulder from collapsing. One thing that I really like that is kind of funny, but I personally use, because I'm a side sleeper, I use a pregnancy pillow. It's a C-shaped pillow. You can buy them on Amazon for $40, $30 nothing expensive. Uh, I don't have to, you know, keep track of three, four different pillows a night because they all run away from me. You know, I can just have one and it's all, all there for me. It gives me the right support. And, you know, this is a big deal. And so it, it's worth spending your time to do the research, go out there, try different pillows, and then find the one that gives you the right support, that give you the straight spine, and then, and then, you know, and invest in one and then use it. And then when you wear down the pillow, get another one. You know, this is what keeps your spine healthy. So again, I can't belabor this point enough. It, it's like this old car that you maintain. It's going to last a long time. You know, we go, we take our car to the, um, to the shop to get it checked every, you know, 5,000 miles, 10,000 miles. The spine is no different. If you, you know, use your spine properly, you modify your lifestyle, good posture all the time, and then you maintain it. Uh, you know, by eating clean and then living healthy and sleeping well and then and, and improving your sleep hygiene and exercising. You know, these are all obviously, you know, um, 
in a cliches, but it really works well in the spine is incredibly important to prevent neck, neck pain. So again, it's a, it's a team approach. You know, I as a neurosurgeon can only do so much and a chiropractor or a physical therapist can only do so much. We all have to work together. That's why I work with a network of people and I rely on their knowledge and experience, their skill set to get people better. And so when you come see me, uh, there's gonna be a lot of discussions about, hey, what are your interests in physical therapy? What have you tried? What have you not tried? What do you uh, feel fear fearful about trying? And now we're gonna try to get other experts involved you know, to get you better. So it's all about using a team and then understanding your needs and then your anatomy and your body to optimize longevity, pain control, function, quality of life, and ultimately happiness. All right, so I'm, I'm a surgeon. So when we meet, what are some of the things that I care about? What are some of the things that we're gonna talk about? Well, um, number one, we're gonna talk a lot about your pain. You know, how did your pain start? Was there an accident? Did you fall or did it just kind of happen? Where does it hurt exactly? I remember, you know, remember, you know, neck means different things to people. And I'm gonna be looking at, you know, maybe different parts of the body that are also affected because those are all hints that there's something else going on. It's really an investigation. Just because we got a CT scan and MRI doesn't necessarily mean that the answer is right there. Someone has to synthesize all this information and, and basically try to make sense of it in the context of you. And then we're gonna talk about what the pain feels like. Is it electrical? Is it shooting? Does it move around? Is it always in the same spot? Is it more on the one side? Is it more on the other side? Is it always both? Um, is it burning? Is it throbbing? All those things actually mean something. And all those things usually are little hints that uh, of which body parts are affected. Again, I told you I'm interested in you know, the origin of the problem. Is it the muscle? Is it the bone? Is it the disc? Is it the nerve? Is it the hip? You know, all those things are going through my mind and all these questions are basically trying to get information out of you in an open-ended fashion so that I can put it together, just like any other profession professional would do uh, to come up with the plan, a diagnosis and a plan. But the, the most important question for me as a surgeon is, okay, you got pain. What does it mean to you? How does it affect your life? If you say, oh, it's annoying, but it's not too bad. I can do most of the things that I want to do. You don't need surgery. Absolutely no surgery. That's the last thing I want to talk about. I'll still talk about all the things that we talked about today. And I'd be happy to go over all that in person. But the surgery is not, there has no role. But if you say, I've tried everything, physical therapy, occupational therapy, stretching, massage, injections, I've tried all that. My neck is killing me. It zaps all the happiness out of my life. I hate it. You know, my life is terrible because it's neck pain. And your MRI CT scan shows significant mechanical problem that matches up with where the pain is coming from. And it all makes sense. And surgery may have an important role to play. But that's a huge, that's a huge difference. Um, you know, two examples I give you. And so that's why the last question to me is the most important question. So surgical planning, and this is what's going through my mind. So is this a structural problem or is it a functional problem, right? Is it all because the muscles are irritated and or it's very, very um, stiff from, you know, minimal stretching and tight? And is that why you're having neck pain or is there a significant instability, mechanical issue, some kind of hardware issue with the neck that's causing pain? If there is a mechanical hardware problem that just cannot fix, you know, that the body cannot fix on its own, that's where a surgeon may have an important role to play. Another thing is, what is your realistic short-term and long-term goal? And so using my experience of seeing a lot of people with neck pain, I'm going to help you understand what could be realistic for you and what may not be realistic based on your story, your history, your medical problems, where you are in life, um, as well as your mechanical problem. And so that will be my main job to guide you through this complicated process uh, and to help you understand 
uh, why I may recommend surgery, why I, I, I may not recommend surgery. And if I do recommend surgery, why at this time or later? And why this surgery versus another? So there are many, many surgical options. You know, I'm happy to talk about this uh, if we do end up meeting and, and you, you know, end up needing surgery. But again, for neck pain, almost all the time, you don't need surgery. If someone says you have neck pain, you need surgery, you've got to stay away from that person because, you know, 80 to 90% of the time with, if you don't have a disease and your neck just has normal wear and tear, you don't need surgery. You can fix a lot, or you can manage your pain. Pain is never going to completely go away, but you can manage your pain and still have a meaningful, high quality life without ever getting surgery. But if you do need surgery, then it comes in many different types. It goes from very minimally invasive, drilling a little piece of bone in the back of your neck to give nerve more room, all the way to taking the disc out and replacing it with a highly mobile disc, or we can fuse. Um, it all depends on, again, um, the mechanical problem at hand and also your body's need, as well as what you want out of life. And each one has benefits and risks. And, and, and also uh, it depends on, you know, a, a person or, or your risk tolerance and, and also, um, you know, your, your perception of surgery, all those things are very important. But ultimately, no matter what surgery I recommend or another surgeon recommends, um, as long as it is done for the right reason, at the right time, surgery works really well. And it, the results are really durable. There's a lot of studies to show that, again, a well-designed surgery for the right person works really well. And that's why um, it's very important to plug into a team that's very experienced and is willing to listen to your story and really uh, make sense of it all and come up with a plan you know, that's designed around you. Uh, but I just want you to keep in mind, and as I mentioned in the very beginning, our body is meant to go through wear and tear. That is not a disease, it's normal. And that's just unfortunate part of life. Surgery will never be able to reverse or stop the wear and tear. And that's why when people say, well, you have a spine surgery and you have a fusion surgery, now I got another problem. Um, that's true, that spine surgery can to get more spine surgery. And that's because when we do surgery, it is invasive. It unfortunately causes damage and injury to the muscles and the ligaments and tendons, the very structure that we rely on more and more as we age. But surgery goes through them to get to the source of the problem. And our body will never 100% recover, even in the best of hands, only 70 to 80% probably in strength and, and consistency. So you know, every surgery is damaging to the body. There is a price that we pay even for the most successful surgery. Um, and because those muscles and the ligaments do break down around the surgical site, the rest of the spine gets now less support. And they continue to wear, you know, go through the, the wear down process, as I told you. So they're wearing down. There's less support because the muscles are weaker from surgery. Uh, that again, was unfortunately needed. And, and, then, and then the rest of the spine degeneration accelerates. So there is a misconception that, well, I got surgery now as a result, I got more surgery. I mean, that is true to some degree, um, but it's a combination of having had surgery plus the body's ongoing wear and tear. And again, that is why I say, you know, again, we brush teeth to maintain our dental hygiene. We don't expect our teeth to be clean and, and perfect if you, don't br if you brush it once a month. And exactly the same thing for spine. We use it all the time, just like our teeth. And so we have to constantly be conscientious of how we use our spine, work at it to keep it maintained and healthy, maintain your spine health through all these things I talked about so that you can, you can avoid surgery altogether and also enjoy your spine as long as you can. And um, again, one other thing that I want to talk about surgery and or any kind of procedure for that matter, or all the things that I talked about today is that nothing will completely eliminate pain. 
Unfortunately, that is part of life. That is part of wear and tear. There are things that we can do to manage pain, but unfortunately, pain is always going to be there. So it's all about reducing to pain the level that you can tolerate comfortably so that you can continue to enjoy life and do the things that you want. And, and that's why this is a big mission. It's a complex mission and it requires lifelong partnership between a surgeon, you, the community, and other, other providers. So, um, you know, I, I know I've been talking for a while, but this, these are my takeaway messages. Neck pain, again, most of the time, you don't need surgery. Stay away from surgeons. Um, and then, you know, non-surgical treatments that, you know, that we talked about work very, very well. So make sure you research them, you understand them, you know what options are available, and then you employ them daily. And then, um, you know, when, when the pain is so severe that, or you have other problems that are going on at the same time, such as again, you know, radiating arm pain or weakness or, or walking difficulty, when there's some other red flags, they say, whoa, this neck pain is not normal. There's something else going on. You should seek medical help. And then, um, you know, when those problems cause significant negative impact on your quality of life and your life goals, that's when a surgeon should get involved with the conversation, not to do surgery, but to see if there's a role to be played. And then again, you need a lot of different experts to maintain your neck and your spine health. But with all that, I really believe that we can conquer neck pain. So lastly, what is my role? Again, to form partnership with you in the community, do education sessions like this, to really talk to people about what I believe you know, is important you know, to maintain spine health, uh, to reduce the pain in the neck so that you can continue to live your life, uh, hopefully to the fullest, share decision-making by listening to your story, and incorporating my medical knowledge and experience to compass what, what makes sense for you, a, a comprehensive long-term plan that will keep you out of, uh, of, of the uh, of pain and also uh, out of trouble. And also me, like other neurosurgeons, work with a lot of different providers, such as therapists, chiropractors, uh, pain spe specialists. So if you were to come see me or other, other surgeons, um, you're tapping into the network. Again, you know, this is a team of effort. And then if you do end up getting surgery for whatever reason, my goal is to not just do the surgery and disappear into the abyss, but to guide you through the rest of the recovery so that you can get back to your life and beyond. Because surgery really is, if you do need surgery, surgery is still, I'd say five, 10% into your journey. You know, so that's just the beginning to get your mechanical issue addressed. And then the rest falls back on the non-surgical treatment and, and continuous support and education. So um, I'll stop there. Again, that's my name. Um, and that's my contact information. My office is in Laguna Hills, uh, nearby Salvac Hospital, but I'm very proud to be partnering with Providence um, to provide what I believe is the best neurosurgical care in the region.